In 1901, there was a welterweight boxing champion that went by the name of Joe Walcott. He had real punching power, but dude only stood 5'2", 130 pounds, soaking wet. He was taking on people way bigger than him and knocking them out. One of his most famous fights was against Joe Choinsky, a guy who stood 6 feet, 175 pounds, which may as well have been a million weight classes above where Walcott was fighting. If I got any fight fans out there, you know that in today's boxing, especially for the smaller weight classes, they got a new weight class every five pounds or so. So this cat is going in fighting a dude that's 45 pounds heavier than him. It's a big deal, until it isn't. Walcott went into that fight and knocked dude down in the first round. They had to stop the whole thing by the seventh because it was an absolute beatdown. At some point in Walcott's career, Walcott would easily win that fight and go on to coin the term, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. A term later made famous by Bob Fitzsimmons. In comes the subject of today's video, David Boston, a guy who kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger until his inevitable fall from grace. This is what happened to David Boston. Chew the way. David Boston was born and raised in Humble, Texas, a place I'm pretty familiar with, right? David's brother joined the task force, police officer. His sister became an attorney. His mom was a retired teacher and his dad was a retired NFL line judge. So David was a little bit different as he was the athlete of the family. In high school, he relied on his speed to outmaneuver guys. But going into his junior year, he had a growth spurt going from 5'9 to 6'2. So you're taking a player that was already going off who's now really starting to develop and grow into his body. He dominated his next two years of high school football and got a scholarship offer to Ohio State. David hit the ground running when he made it to college freshman year. He had 33 catches and 450 yards and seven touchdowns great freshman season and he actually got better the following year. He improved his numbers to 73 grabs for 970 yards and 14 TDs. In an interview, his college quarterback Joe Germain said David was a quiet guy off the field and really humble, but on the field, he was a different person, which is something I think you definitely need to play a sport like this. He also capped that season off with one of the greatest moments of his entire football career, making the game-winning catch in the Rose Bowl. At that point, he was on every NFL team's radar. He followed that up with a historic season. The man had 85 grabs, 1,435 yards, and 13 TDs. Beast mode. And despite the fact that he was 6'2", 215, he was also the punt returner. What did he do there? <laughs> Just another 900 yards, man, nothing, nothing really. As a matter of fact, his 191 reception record was literally just broken this year. He also broke the record for receiving yards with 2,855 yards. Another record that would eventually be broken, but my point is he's setting these benchmarks when he was playing. Having these records in the first place is extremely important. And if he would have came back for that last year, he could have put these records so far out of reach, but he did the smart thing when got his bread. When David Boston got to the combine, he did not disappoint. At the same time, he really didn't blow people away. I mean, he measured in at 6'2", solid size. 215, pretty good. Ran a 4'4". I mean, these aren't Calvin Johnson numbers, but these are NFL numbers easily, right? 37 inch vertical, damn near 10 foot broad jump. This man was a beast. He ended up becoming the eighth overall pick in the 1999 NFL Draft going to the Arizona Cardinals. Fun fact, the only receiver that was taken over him was Torrey Holt. Now at the time, the Cardinals didn't need a wide receiver. They actually had two really good players in Rob Moore and Frank Sanders, but David was the best player available on their board, so they drafted the talent instead of going with need. It didn't take David long to acclimate to the NFL. He quickly became one of the top receivers on the team, catching 40 passes for 473 yards and two touchdowns. Now, obviously these aren't eye-popping numbers, but again, we're talking a rookie who went to a team with two established wide receivers that actually had him playing in the slot that first year. So he was playing a smaller role, but dude was really, really good 
in that role and clearly the potential was there. So at this point, everything was looking great for David Boston. His college career went great. He was drafted top 10. He had a good rookie season, but then the unthinkable happened. Something that would change the course of David's life and career. After David's rookie year, he and his college teammate, Neil Diggs, now a linebacker for the Green Bay Packers, were driving home one night, presumably from a party kickback or some sort. But according to reports, they were not intoxicated. But it was late, they was driving home. That's, that's the important part. Little did they know, a high-speed chase was heading straight for them. Then out of nowhere, this truck comes over the hill, running from the cops, bam, slams directly into David's Hummer, and the driver of the runaway truck actually passed away from the impact. And that is a pretty crazy thing. Imagine you just driving your vehicle, chilling, bam, somebody running from a cop running to you and then they die. Fortunately for David and Diggs, they came out of the wreck uninjured, but it was that tough guy kind of uninjured. All right, for example, you know how at the end of the shootout in the cop show or movie, you know that tough cop, probably the protagonist of the film, you know how the medics walk over and he's just ah, <laughs> refusing treatment. You, you know the scene I'm talking about. You've seen this many times. Yeah, that was David and his boy. Ah, we, we good, man. <laughs> straight they get in their car they drive home but i believe that once in a lifetime freak accident altered david's life forever wrong place wrong time unfortunate man a few months later david would find out that he actually was injured in that accident he had sustained nerve damage in his leg, which made it difficult to flex his foot. In addition to that, he found weakness in his lower back and the doctors told him there was pretty much nothing that they could do. This sucks because David was scheduled to go work out with Chris Carter and Randy Moss that summer. Imagine the gyms he would have picked up the improvements that he could have made to his game. Now you insert a completely different type of workout regimen, rehab. A regimen that includes new supplements, new trainers. Instead of going to work out with Chris and Randy, he instead hired a new trainer named Charles Poliquin. He worked out with him and a guy named Jerry Sullivan. Instead of focusing on improvement from his rookie season, David now had to focus on trying to re-strengthen his back and foot. They put him on a strict diet, intense workout plan, and an intense supplement regimen. What exactly were these supplements? Nobody's really sure, but they definitely behaved a lot like steroids. Then the strangest thing happened. A guy who was a good wide receiver, solid size, solid speed, solid all around, and was gonna be a really good pro, over the course of one summer, got injured in a wreck, and not only shook back, but added 15 pounds of muscle. Body percent went down about 5%, and he's running a faster speed. It's possible for a full grown man to gain 15 pounds of muscle and get faster even though he's already a peak athlete is technically possible. Is it unlikely? Yeah. And we know that certain performance enhancement drugs can help to heal up injuries, which would have been David's motive at this point, but he was tested and he did not test positive for steroids, so that's important. When a 10% body fat, 230 pound David showed up to training camp, his teammates and coaches were in shock of his new body. Imagine how other DBs felt. They got bullied that season. At this point, some begin to speculate that David was using steroids, but again, he didn't test positive. Maybe the test was inadequate, maybe he had a really good workaround with his trainers, or maybe he wasn't on steroids. Maybe, it's a possibility. But another thing happened that kind of pointed in that direction. David's personality changed. Here's a few of the side effects from steroid use. Altered mood, irritability, increased aggression. Predictably, David's laid back, quiet demeanor that his college quarterback actually spoke about, yeah, that went out the window. Dude started feeling himself way too much and becoming a little bit of a rock star, but his production didn't decline. And just like in college, his stats went up the following season. So over time, his role increases. They move him to the outside receiver. He catches 71 passes for 1,100 yards and seven touchdowns. It seems like whatever regiment he was on was working, man. It was giving him the results that he needed. The problem was he couldn't stop. The following year, he showed up to camp only 6% body fat. Now he was weighing about 245 pounds. 
again he came into the league at 215 running a 44 now he's 245 and he's somehow running even faster than before like what david had the best season of his career 98 catches 1600 yards eight touchdowns he made his first pro bowl made his first all pro yo remember brian erlacher yeah linebacker for the chicago bears 6'5 260 when he ran into david boston at the pro bowl he stood next to him and was like bro your arms are bigger than mine and look i ain't saying that erlacher was the one that snitched but after that the steroid and hgh rumors start swirling like crazy i mean it didn't have to be Erlacher. Again, the man gained 30 pounds and got faster as a already full-grown NFL player. It does, that doesn't happen. A month after the Pro Bowl, David Boston got arrested for a DUI. Not alcohol. David wouldn't drink and drive. It was cocaine. Now, keep in mind, there was no social media back then, so this really got swept under a rug, and David got off with a hand slap. You could get away with a lot back in the day. This man was so full of himself and so embracing his new rock star persona that he got piercings everywhere. Now, listen, get piercings, do whatever you want. Piercings is cool. I think, I think most piercings are dope, but not these. The man got his nipples pierced, bro. He got his nipples pierced the same day that he had practice. Then he went to practice, announced, that he had gotten it done and that the dbs better not hit him because he was tender this is not you can't make this up like i don't stuff like this i don't even be wanting to have to report on this bro like i don't want to have to say this but yo <laughs> he did it it's important so after the nipple piercing the cocaine use and the obvious steroid use david was on bad terms with the organization Obviously. It got so bad that one night before a game, dude had a female in his room and the coach told her to leave. But David wanted her to stay. So he told the coach, check it out, bro. Either she stays or I don't play. So the coach did what he had to do. He let her stay. Yeah. Needless to say, David felt untouchable at this point, but his steroid use had gone from healing an injury to an absolute obsession. Dude had gotten way too big and his cardiovascular system was starting to betray him. After five or six plays, he's absolutely winded. And now he was bigger, stronger, faster, but he was a way worse player. He had regressed. Remember the intro, bigger they are, harder they fall? Well, David finally fell eight games into that season when he tore his patella tendon. He ended up having season in the knee surgery and he'd never play for the Cardinals again. This man's only concern before he left the building for good was to ask his trainer to hook him up with another trainer that was similar to this trainer. You feel what I'm saying? So his trainer hooked him up with Ian Danny, a bobsledder slash biochemist and advanced theorist. And let's just say he definitely tested some performance theories on David. He had him on a ridiculous supplement regimen that we're gonna talk about a little bit more in just a second. That offseason, David had plenty of suitors and the Chargers called him first and he ended up making a deal with them, signing a seven year, $47 million contract. Now, during negotiation, he told them that he would work out with the team only twice a week because all the rest of the time he needed to be working out with his trainer with, you know, steroids and HGH or whatever he was taking. He probably left that part out, but only twice a week. And if they could not agree to that, he wouldn't sign they agreed they signed him 47 mil 12 mil guaranteed now the Chargers agreed because they were thinking that they were getting the 2001 version of David Boston but they wouldn't get him they'd get this new guy a guy who was bigger faster and better than 2001 David Boston but he wasn't nearly the football player of the old guy his new trainer ian the biochemist yeah he had david taking over 90 pills per day that's not an exaggeration not to mention he's hooking dude up to an iv every single day just trying to pump as much muscle into this man as possible as you can see at this point david's completely gone his goals have completely changed he went from i want to be a better football player to i just want to be the biggest dude that exists you know what i'm saying and it got to the point where it's literally making him a worse and worse and worse football player it's it's kind of unbelievable when you think about it that prolonged steroid use really started to affect david in unforeseen ways his actual jawline changed and his old teammates and people from his old life 
couldn't even recognize the dude when they looked at him. The literal shape of his face drastically changed. When David was asked if he was on steroids, here's what he had to say. I hear this all the time. People question me because my physique is totally different from everybody else in this league. What am I supposed to do? I pass every drug test, I eat the right things, I work out hard. And when I sign a big contract, instead of buying a Benz, I move my trainer out here. Some people go to the movies. I like to lift weights and run. All I care about is my body. I take hot and cold contrast baths to flush intake. I take antioxidants. I eat egg whites and cottage cheese, lean steak with asparagus, protein shakes before and after practice, sushi, simple carbs. I eat six, seven meals a day. Yeah, I'm over 250, but I'll be 240 on opening day. I can lose weight anytime I want. Now, most of that is a bit obsessive, but again, we're talking to pro athletes, so, you know, that's about normal. Now, that's really more bodybuilder type stuff, but still physical condition. I mean, you know, cool. Could he lose weight whenever he wanted to? I kind of doubt it because, again, his production was slipping, his route running was getting worse, and his injuries were increasing. The added weight was most definitely not helping him on the football field. Instead of getting 2001 David, the Chargers got Rockstar David, a dude who was worried about his size and the way he smelled in the locker room and what color contacts he wore on the daily. His former teammate Marcellus Wiley used to joke that the 6'2", 260 pound wide receiver could come in and play the lineman if somebody got hurt, saying he'd probably get 30 sacks a year because he runs a 4'3". But David wouldn't even make it a full year with the Chargers. It was only 14 games before he cursed out the strength coach. At this point, dude was really just a distraction and a loose cannon. So after signing for 47 million, he was traded for a six round pick to the Miami Dolphins. He had a decent season there, 70 catches for 880 yards, seven touchdowns. But he ended up injuring his knee that season and missed the 2004 season when he finally got popped for the first time for steroids. So there it is, now it's official. I don't know if the testing got better or if his dosage got out of control or what was going on, but the man was clearly on something for years before they finally got a positive test. David continued to spiral out of control, even punching an airline ticket agent for not letting him board a plane. He came back in 2005 and only played five games for Miami before they ultimately released him. In 06, he had a short tenure with the Tampa Bay Bucks, who gave him one last shot that he threw away by getting yet another DUI. This time he was caught with GHB, which is known as a date rape drug, but it's also used by bodybuilders to produce growth hormones. He missed the season opener, got cut, never played in the league again. Things didn't get better for David after his career ended. His wife called the police on him in 2007 for aggravated assault and false imprisonment. He hit her while she was carrying their baby. The following year, the CFL called, but David showed up with a stress fracture in his foot, had to have surgery and missed the entire season, then was cut. He didn't resurface again until 2011 for aggravated battery against a woman that he'd been staying with for six weeks in Florida. Dude had been drinking, popping pills, and he was trying to bring the lady back to his hotel. She didn't want to go. At that point, he began to try to force her. Her friend jumps in, he knocks both of them down, and ends up punching the lady in the face twice. Believe it or not, he only ended up serving six months in jail for this. The judge ended up being pretty lenient with the sentence because of possible CTE connection from playing football. Now again, this was in 2011. After this, David finally went back home to Humboldt, Texas and just sat down, thought, and cleared his brain a bit. Just slow down, bro. In 2013, David finally started to do some good, man. Do some positive out here. Started a youth camp trying to help kids to not make the same mistakes that he did. It's crazy because David Boston started out as the victim in this scenario. He got hit by a random driver. Again, this is something that he had no control over. He sustained injuries in the wreck which altered his career. And then in order to try to save his career, he started a HGH or a steroid regimen just to get back to where he was before. But ironically, the stronger and stronger he got physically, the weaker and weaker he got mentally and morally. 
This caused him to get addicted to whatever substance he was taking and it quickly spiraled out of control. Now, he had a solid career with a few years of absolute dominance, but had it not been for that car wreck and his subsequent steroid use, we could be talking about one of the great receivers to play in the league. Instead, we're just talking a cautionary tale of what could have been. Sad story, sad ending, had to be told. My name is Flimlo Raps. I'm out until next time, fellas. Check out one of these other videos on the screen if you haven't seen them yet.